Now we have Eric talking to us about using containers for high-performance computing. All right, thank you. Hi, everyone. Uh, typically, for any presentation, I will first introduce myself, but I only get 10 minutes, so I'm going to skip all of that and jump straight to it. Um, I also, for this talk, I want all of you to forget that you're a sysadmin or operations or whatever you call yourself nowadays. It doesn't really matter. I'm going to try and put you in the shoes of a computational scientist or a data scientist for a moment and try and see things from their perspective. So imagine that you have a tool that you're testing out. Uh, this is on your local desktop. Uh, you're trying a new thing, and this tool has a really simple syntax. You run it, you give it a file name that you want it to process, and it generates an output on the same directory uh, with statistics about the file or whatever. And you, the problem that you have is that you want to run this with several, several million files. So obviously your local laptop is probably not the best choice and you want to run this in a cluster. You're prototyping on your desktop obviously because you want to make sure that the tool actually does what, what it's promising to do in, before you actually launch it at scale. So um, to try it out and, and sort of have a, a draft script that, that you're going to use once you have this in a cluster, you decide that a for loop is probably the most efficient way to go about it. So you go to where you have a, a sample or a subset of the files that you want to process, and you don't have a, a job scheduler on your local laptop, so you just leave that blank. But you just do a for loop, and then you process all of the files uh, sequentially, one after another. And after a few minutes where you just went for coffee or lunch, uh, you come back and you see and you have results. So OK, great. The tool actually works, does what it promised. So you go to this assignment and you bug him and you say, can you please get this going in the cluster I need it for a project? And this assignment looks at the tool and says, well, actually, it's really easy for you to get it installed in your desktop because you're running, I don't know, Ubuntu, Cosmic, or Arch Linux, or whatever, and that's in the repos. But our cluster uses CentOS 7, and the libraries that this tool depends on are also system libraries, but the versions conflict, and to compile the whole thing manually is just a hassle. So I'm, I'm going to give you a container for it. And you think, OK. Containers for data science, I heard of that before, but I haven't had a chance to practice that, so uh, it will be a good experience to, to actually try and, and use it. And the system gives you the URL to the company's private registry where you can get the container from. And because you're new to Docker and containers, you decided that you're going to try it on just one file just to see if um, everything works as expected. So you go in and you try your first Docker run. You tell it to process just the first file, and you get this long hash as an output, uh, which you remember from the Getting Started tutorials. Then you look at the output to see if there are any, and there's none. What happened? We forgot to mount the files. So you add the minus B flag to your Docker run. You say, just mount this directory inside a container, and I'm going to tell the tool to process the file in this new location that exists only in the container. And you run it, and you check the results. There's none. And worse than that, you check the logs for the container, and you get this permission denied there. Now, why would that be? The tool actually worked in our desktop. Why wouldn't that be the case in the server? So you go to the sysadmin, obviously, and you say, hey, this doesn't work. Please fix it. And the sysadmin says, well, remember, we're running CentOS 7, so we have a Linux blocking the containerized process accessing your files. So you need to tell Docker to tell us in Linux to behave. And you do that by adding this colon Z flag. And you have no idea what is Linux is or what it does, but you do as you're told and you run it. You check the output, you still get nothing, and you still get the permission denied error in the logs. So you go back to the sysadmin and say, just get on with it and install it manually, compile it if you have to. Docker is clearly not working here. And the sysadmin says, actually, I got no more denials in the log files, so that actually did the trick. The problem you have is that these files are owned and readable only by yourself. They don't have the read permissions for everyone. And this container was created using a non-privileged user, because I don't want the tool to run as root. But that user identity is different from the one that you have. So you need to make sure that you know, the permissions are sorted out. And you have no idea what any of this means, but you heard permissions, you're a data scientist, so you know how to fix this. And you go and see HMOD the file. <laughs> and because you're tired of copying and pasting hashes all over the place, you decide to give your lovely container a name, little baby. And you run it, you check the outputs, you still get a permission and an error, and by this point, you're fed up. You go back to this assignment, almost angry now, and you say, look, this is clearly not working. And the guy says, actually, if you pay attention, 
that permission denied error is different from the one that you were having before. Now the error is that you cannot write the output, not that you cannot read the input. So we're making progress. The guy looks at your Docker run syntax and says, the problem you have, and you really shouldn't have done the chmod right there, the problem you have is the directory where the files are is only writable by yourself as well. Now, before you go away and you do another chmod and run, grant everyone write access to there, it might be a better idea if you just run the container as yourself. So you just add this minus u flag in there, and you type in the, U, the um, UID and the GID that, the, um, that you, you yourself have, instead of using the one hard-coded in the container. And again, you have no idea what any of this means, but you just do as you're told, copy and paste that into your command line, and, oh, yes, of course, <laughs> sorry. Turns out that we had to remove the, the test container we did before, so we run that again, and finally we get an output, we're making progress. And the problem here is that this is quite clunky if you're a data scientist. All you care about are the tool, the version that you're running, the input, and the output. Everything else is just fluff that you shouldn't even have to think about. And not only that, remember that we're processing millions of files, not just the one. So if you want to do this at a really, really large scale, you end up with a for loop that looks a little bit like that. And if you cannot read or interpret any of that, that's fine, that's the point. It's actually almost unreadable to figure out what's going on here. So in our cluster, we started looking for alternatives to Docker, and we came across this tool that was released in 2016 by Scilabs called Singularity, which is a different container engine. And let's look at how Singularity actually makes this process so much simpler. Here you can see that the first command is actually pulling a Docker image from a Docker registry and storing that into a flat file. It's actually flattening all of the layers in the container image. And you can then run that image file directly. You don't even need to do singularity run, although that's also a possibility. And by running that directly, you can also just pass it any arguments to the image um, directly without having to even think about it. So that for loop that we saw before, changes to something like this. And notice also that I'm not even having to say which user do you want to impersonate. Singularity doesn't allow you to do that. You can run containers as, just as yourself. And also, you don't even need to worry about by mounting volumes to the container because Singularity takes care of that, takes care of that for you as well. It would automatically map home, TMP, slash dev, slash proc, and a few other ones. And the sysadmin can configure global mount points that should be present on all of the containers that are run on the host as well. So you don't even need to worry about by mounting file systems as well. So if you have a similar use case to this, and you want your users to be able to run containers and not get root access, which is obviously a terrible idea in a shared uh, environment like an HPC cluster, don't use Docker, have a look at Singularity. This is the URL. If you work for these guys, come and see me after a break. We can talk about my commission. Thank you. Any questions? We have time for maybe a couple of questions just before the next talk. Debatable. Be because this is a uh, tool for high performance computing, I'm kind of assuming it has options for job distribution and multiple containers across different CPUs in the machine and different machines in a cluster. How easy is that to do? It doesn't, actually. Ah. All you can do with Singularity is to just create and run containers. Distributing jobs across a cluster is not the, the uh, container engine's job. It's actually the job scheduler that you use for your HPC. <coughs> Um, obviously, you have to install Singularity in every, every node that you have in the, in the cluster that you manage, but there are no daemons. It's just an SUID binary that you can just run. So you could possibly install it in the share volume or the share storage that all of the nodes uh, have access to, just like you would with any other tool that you install for um, a shared environment. Anyone else? Hey, Eric, I think we met before in a CI conference briefly. Mm -hmm. um, 
I believe you, we are probably using the same HPC. Um, so I just wanted to see if you have a production case that I can use in my company to also. Uh, is it NASI supercomputer that you're accessing and running single-added containers? Can you, can you repeat the question? Uh, are you using these containers on the NASI supercomputer here in New Zealand? or? No, we're using this in our in-house cluster. Um, actually, I do have another talk on Thursday that shows this, uh, using this um, for a big project that we ran last year and we're still currently running. But did Shameless you get, plug, if you want to see this in action, you can. But did you get this to a supercomputer here yet or just in a cluster in our, our, com our company? So basically, if you want to run these container images, you need to have Singularity installed. Um, but so long as you have that uh, in anywhere, you can just run the images. I guess just a follow-on question. So does anyone know if Nessie allows Docker or Singularity to run on their systems? I believe the answer is no, but don't quote me on it. We're probably still in chat with them to see if that's possible. 